It's 4 p.m. on Friday, April 25th here in Korea, live from Seoul, I'm Moon Gun Young. It's been more than nine days since a nearly 7,000 ton solar ferry sank off Korea's southwestern coast with more than 470 people on board. More bodies have been retrieved from the sunken vessel overnight and this morning, lowering the number of missing to 119, but raising the death toll to 183. However, also of a great concern here is an investigation on the authorities, and they are broadening the investigation into what exactly happened on the day the Seoul Ferry capsized and who exactly is responsible for this man made disaster. For more details on that and on the updates, we connect live with our Yudian. She is standing by at the news center. Leah, now, how is the investigation coming along? Uh, are, are, are we getting any closer to figuring out what the cause of this tragedy is? Konyang, an advisory panel of 13 experts has been set up to answer that question, and they held their very first meeting about an hour ago at 3 p.m. local time. The panel includes professors, maritime specialists, and experts from the shipping industry. They will attempt to reconstruct the accident using a mock-up of the ferry. Prosecutors are also looking into another ferry called the Ohamanaho Ferry, also owned by the operator of the Seoro Ferry, to look for possible clues as to why the Seoro sank. The Ohamana Ferry is almost identical to the Seoro Ferry in size and follows the same route. After raiding the Ohamanaho Ferry, prosecutors have found out out that most of its safety equipment, such as the life rifts and tubes, did not function properly. It's not a stretch to say, according to investigators, that the story would have been much the same for the Seoro Ferry. Now, Leona, can you tell us uh, what are the most likely causes for this accident? Right, Kanyang, a number of possible causes have been raised over the past several days, but three have emerged as the most probable scenarios. One is that the Seoro ferry made a sudden right turn as it attempted to do a P turn. Another possibility that the three and a half thousand tons of freight on board was not secured properly, causing all the containers and vehicles in the cargo hold to list one side, tilting the ferry. And lastly, prosecutors are looking in to see whether the ferry was simply un stable due to the renovations made to the ferry to maximize the number of passengers and cargo. Hopefully the expert panel will narrow down those possibilities. That's right. Yeah, we are hoping that the experts of the panel of experts will uh, also um, really focus on all of those possibilities. And we actually had a uh, foreign expert who said it's probably the chain of errors, all three of them linked together, that finally led to this tragic, tragic accident. But Liam, what about the crew members of this solo ferry? And most of them are facing criminal charges, I believe. That's right. Looking at the investigations unfold, it seems all 15 rescued crew members, including the captain, Lee jun Hawk, will face criminal charges. Eleven have already been charged with negligent homicide while violating maritime law, with the remaining four under investigation as suspects. Now, investigation continues into the ferry's operator as well, which is facing accusations that it has lobbied its way out of getting safety checkups for its vessel. Amid the crackdown, we are learning that the practical owner owner of the Seoro ferry operator, Yu byung on was involved in embezzlement. We have just found out today that he and his family own at least three paper companies. Investigators say these companies were used for deals among the ferry operators, operators' affiliates to set up the funds that the prosecution suspect were used for possible kickbacks and other irregularities. Also earlier, prosecutors ordered the second son and a daughter of Yu byung on to return to Korea by next Tuesday for questioning. I'll bring you more updates in our later newscasts. Now, the Seoul Ferry disaster has highlighted a lot of what is wrong with Korea, and the government has come under fire for its handling of the incident. Korea's main opposition party has denounced the presidential office of Cheong Wade and is calling for a cabinet reshuffle. Our Chi Myung-gil has this report. There's just over a month to go before the June 4th local elections, but the ruling Henry Party's priority is sorting out the mess it finds itself in. The Seoro Ferry disaster has prompted calls to root out systematic bureaucracy to prevent a similar tragedy happening again. 
President Park Geun-hye has hinted at a major administration reshuffle before the June 4th elections and is mulling a grand plan to shore up the nation's safety regulations. However, former politicians are advising the president to do more than just replace a few officials, saying the government needs structural reforms and the way it goes about its business should be completely revamped. The main opposition New Politics Alliance for Democracy has blasted the presidential office, accusing it of trying to dodge responsibility after the national security adviser said he was not in charge of overseeing disaster management. The adviser said his office is not the control tower for handling disasters, but the remarks have not gone down well as his office was the one that reported the ferry sinking to the presidential office. The opposition party says the presidential office is trying to shift the blame to other government offices amid mounting public anger that more lives could have been saved if the government had properly handled the situation. In response to the disaster, lawmakers are working on bills to expand restrictions on any government officials hired by entities financed by the government or those undertaking tasks related to public services. Jim young Arirang News. Now, 183 people have now been confirmed dead in the sinking of the ferry, and 119 others remain missing. In waters off Korea's southwestern coast, where the accident happened, search operations are now well into its 10th day. Not a single survivor has been found since the ferry capsized last Wednesday morning, but efforts do continue, with authorities having decided to use what's called a diving bell at the site for the first time this afternoon. For the latest, we now go live to our Song Ji-san at Pengmokung Harbor, the nearest point of land to the accident site. Ji-san. Kanyang, the search and rescue operation continues on this Friday, although the conditions are less favorable to the previous days as the wind and the current is stronger. The bodies of three female bodies have been recovered, most likely the students of Dhanun High School, and the death toll now stands at 183, with 119 still missing. Around 90 percent of the victims in this tragedy were the students. The divers will continue their search on the third floor where the cafeteria is and on the fourth level of the ship where the cabins of most Hanwon High School students were located, focusing on the center of the deck. A diving bell, a chamber that can be used as a base and transportation of divers underwater, has arrived at the accident site and will be deployed in a few hours. This will help to increase the number of divers engaged in search operations and would enable them to stay underwater for up to an hour without interruption. Search will go on as parents of the missing have requested that the ferry not be lifted out of water until every body is recovered. Five cranes are on standby, but no one assumes that the lifting will take place anytime soon. Now, Jisan, uh, it seems like tensions between the families of the missing and authorities involved in the search operations have passed the boiling point. Um, have things come down a bit? Kanyang, this all out efforts came after. The very sad, desperate, and angry parish shows strong distrust and doubts about the ongoing operation going on here on site. They actually sit down with the Minister of the Oceans and Fisheries, as well as the Chief Commissioner of the Coast Guard, from Thursday evening overnight, questioning them about the search execution in details. The parents want more civilian divers be brought into the operation, as they think there were not enough divers out there to recover the bodies of their children. While authorities had announced over 700 divers would be utilized for search operations, only 81 actually went into water Thursday and 88 were scheduled to take part on this Friday. The reduced number is for the safety of the divers, as they need at least 12 hours between dives to decompress, and only a handful can be underwater simultaneously due to limited space within the ferry, not to mention the limited number of diving distance lines. Civilian divers are reported to have contributed tremendously in the initial stages of the search and rescue, installing guidelines into the ferry. The diving bell also belongs to a private company. Several parents are also out on the waters on the barge where divers are engaged in search operations. The maritime minister and Coast Guard chief will stay on site to direct the operations and assist the families, as parents requested, until the last student is brought back on shore. This was Hong Jisun reporting live from Pengmokang Harbor in Sindo. 
Well, let's now try getting a better sense of what's to come in terms of search, rescue, and salvage operations down off Korea's southwestern coast. For that, Captain Nicholas Sloan joins us live on the line from Italy. Nicholas Sloan is a Marine master with over 30 years of experience and was in charge of salvage operations of the wrecked Costa Concordia cruise ship off Italy. Captain Sloan, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, good day and greetings from Italy. Now, uh, let's start with the uh, search and rescue operations here in Korea now in their 10th day. Now, based on your expertise and experience in this field, uh, which stage is the Korean rescue team at? And, and please do compare this case with the Costa Concordia case. Well, I think the priority at the moment is obviously the uh, search and recovery of all the victims. So that's the, the main priority. And I think the, the fact that they've brought the diving bell on location is, is a very positive sign because uh, it's, it's, it's almost like looking inside a hotel that you turn it upside down. So the obstructions and the uh, restrictions for the diving access into the ship itself are very difficult. And you've got to look after the well-being and, and the safety of the divers. So now they'll go in and they have to do a methodical search uh, deck by deck and passage by passageway. And there'll be certain areas that they'll have to deem as too risky to enter. Unfortunately, those areas would have to be left left until a later stage for the search, mainly due to the risk of the divers. I think at the same time, the, the uh, experts on site will have to assess the condition of the ship, what, what actually caused her to capsize in the first place. And I think initially uh, it looks like it was more from a cargo shift than hitting an underwater obstruction. So that, that's good for the uh, future refloating of the vessel, is that the hull looks to be intact. And along with all of the resources that are on site, they can start planning towards that. But that's going to be a few weeks away before they even start that operation. Uh, the search and rescue is going to become more and more difficult as they go deeper into the ship. So they've got to be patient and then come up with a plan that's going to work and doesn't damage the ship further. Now, uh, it's been more than 10 days and there are talks of salvage operations to be carried out uh, in the weekend or, or later than that. Now, um, Captain, would you explain to us what the difference is between a search and rescue operation and a salvage operation? Yeah, I think the salvage operation takes a lot longer than the search and rescue. But so while the search and rescue is being carried out, everyone's looking at the options. So they, they're making a model of the ship itself turning it upside down to, to represent the actual condition of, of the casualty. And then they see where the weak parts of the ship are and the strong parts. And they'll focus on trying to do a partial refloat most probably and move her into more sheltered waters. Or if the ship cannot be partially refloated, then do a complete refloat. But the complete refloat will be a lot longer. It's, it's not weeks, but it's months to do that. So on a positive note, you're coming into your summer season so the weather conditions which will impact them, that will dictate what you can do, will get better and better as you come into summer. Now, uh, how long did it take you to, uh, to uh, complete your project on the uh, removal project of the Costa Concordia? Yeah, well, it took 20 months before we rolled it upright in the power bucket operation. And with the Concordia, you're looking at a ship that's three rugby fields long, three football fields long, and weighed over 100,000 tons. So she had actually, the cause of the Concordia was that she hit a rock and that sliced down her side. So you had a, a hole going almost 60 meters along her hull and that flooded all the compartments. So you couldn't rely on any buoyancy in that part of the ship. So everything we have done has been from the outside of the ship to roll it upright and then bring it up. I think uh, on the ferry, you've got an intact hull and uh, you have more options because of, they can get all around it. The Concordia is balance was finally balanced on the edge of a, a rocky cliff underwater so it made it a bit more difficult but still it's not uh, it's not something that you can pick up over a weekend it's going to take months right so um how long do you think this solar ferry salvage operation will take and what will be some of the biggest challenges that uh, these salvage operators here in korea will face well Firstly, the priority has to be the session, rescue, and recovery of uh, the victims. And that, as I said, will take more time than people imagine because of the difficulties as you get deeper into the ship, it becomes more dangerous to the dive teams themselves. So uh, the, uh, the salvage teams themselves who do the second phase, 
uh, first priority would be remove any of the oils and pollutants from the ship. So they'll pump out all of the oils and then they'll bring in the large cranes and they'll either do a partial refloat and move it to sheltered waters where they can spend more time in a, in a sheltered location or go for a full out uh, salvage and recovery, which will take most of the summer. But I think uh, a ship that size, they should be able to move her and have her upright uh, before the end of summer. But it's going to be dependent on the weather conditions. All right, Captain Nicholas Sloan, Senior Salvage Master of the Costa Concordia Removal Project. Thank you so much for speaking with us today. Thank you. Now, the higher the death toll gets, the fewer number of families there are at an auditorium in Jindo that has served as shelter for the past 10 days for all the families of those still unaccounted for. For an update on the situation there, let's go live to our Connie Lee, who is standing by. Connie. Hey, Kanyang, while the families here are still waiting for their loved ones to return to land from the sunken ferry. It's been 10 days now for most of the families who are practically living here inside the Chindo Auditorium. It's an agonizing wait, as for many other families here who for nearly 24 hours a day wait for news on bodies being recovered. At first, there were high hopes that survivors would be found. But now, as search and rescue operations have turned into search and recovery operations, the family members merely hope that the bodies of their loved ones are found. Now, speaking to some of them here, there are fears that the bodies could have drifted out of the ship and into waters far from the coast of Korea. Family members wanted the search operations to end yesterday, but as more than 100 people are still unaccounted for, it looks like the search will have to continue on into the weekend. Reporting live from the Chindo Indoor Auditorium, this has been Connie Lee. Now, the group memorial altar in Ansan was busy all night long and is filled up again on this Friday with visitors from all walks of life lining up to lay flowers in front of the portraits of the young people who so tragically lost their lives in this terrible disaster. We connect live with our Kim Ji-yeon, who is outside the memorial hall. ji -yun. Hello, Kanyang. Inside the halls behind me, portraits of 90 students and teachers are displayed. Around 50,000 people have paid their respects here in Ansan, and I talked to some of them earlier today. I hope they are resting in a warm place. My nephew is still in the ferry. I sincerely hope they rescue him soon. Because a lot of people have come here, I think they are going to cross over to the other side with a smile on their face. Now, Gianna, for those who did not have a chance to visit the memorial yet, uh, can they still go? Yes, Kon uh, It's The memorial is open 24 hours a day and will open throughout the weekend. Another group memorial altar is in the southwestern port city of Bokpo, which is closer to the accident site. Overseas in Australia, a memorial altar will be set up starting Monday until May 2nd at the Western Crow Eden Park from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. local time. Around 77,000 people have also paid a visit to the altar online for the deceased high school students and teachers. I'm Kim Jian reporting live in Ansan Olympic Memorial Hall. Now, in general news, the U.S. President Barack Obama arrived in Seoul earlier this Friday afternoon for a two-day visit. The U.S. president is now at Korea's presidential office of Cheongwade, where the two leaders have reportedly just begun their bilateral summit. 
Now, as for what will top the agenda during his talks with President Park Geun-hye, our correspondent Choi Yoo-sun walks us through from North Korea's recent nuclear threat to South Korea's ferry disaster. Talks this Friday between President Park Geun-hye and U.S. President Barack Obama in Seoul will largely focus on reaffirming their security alliance on the Korean Peninsula. North Korea-related issues, including the North's recent threats to conduct a nuclear test, will be discussed. Strategic talks on the state of affairs in Northeast Asia will also take place. Since their meeting last month on the sidelines of the nuclear security summit in the Netherlands, Pyongyang has threatened to carry out what it called a new form of nuclear test. President Obama is expected to express support for President Park's vision on reunification of the two Koreas. In a speech in Dresden last month, the South Korean leader called for the two Koreas to expand reunions of families separated by the Korean War and increase cross-border economic and cultural exchanges. On the economic front, the two presidents will likely discuss Seoul's possible membership into the Washington-led Trans-Pacific Trade Pact. There's also tension towards what President Obama might say concerning strained Seoul-Tokyo ties over Japan's repeated denials of its imperialistic aggressions. This, especially after he said Japan's disputed islands with China were subject to Washington's defense treaty with Tokyo following talks with his Japanese counterpart Thursday. Reflecting strong Seoul-Washington relations, the U.S. leader will also return nine Korean royal seals that were lost during the Korean War. And as South Koreans mourn the loss of so many lives in a recent ferry disaster, President Obama is set to express his sympathies during his two-day visit. After a meeting with Korean and American business leaders and visiting U.S. forces in Korea, Obama will depart for Malaysia on Saturday. Choi Yoo-sun, Arirang News. The former U.S. Special Representative for North Korea policy has suggested linking North Korea into a global economic network as one of the ways to stop its ongoing nuclear development. Now, speaking at a seminar hosted by the Council on Foreign Relations in Washington Thursday, Stephen Bosworth said inviting the North into the network could remove it from isolation and perhaps persuade it to take a new path. The former envoy stressed the window of opportunity is still open to denuclearize the North, calling on the international community to take action, especially over concerns that North Korea could export nuclear materials to other countries. Now, as the search and rescue operations continue off Korea's southwestern coast for the 10th day, the weather has been playing a big factor in the success or failure of finding more bodies or survivors there. So, to take a look at the weather conditions down in Jindo today, let's go over to our Michelle Park for the updates. Michelle. Well, the weather conditions in Jindo appears to be favorable today with clear skies and visibility of up to 17 kilometers and light wind. Now, however, the speed of the current underwater is up to 6 kilometers and it appears that it will increase throughout the day. Now, currently the water temperature in Jindo is at 12.5 degrees Celsius with winds blowing at 4.3 meters per second and the height of the wave is at 0.7 meters and all of which are slightly higher than yesterday. Now for the rest of the nation we can expect clear skies and sunny uh, however the temperature is of up to high 20s now and with this fine weather we have the fine dust level increasing more throughout the day over the nation. Now going over to our readings Seoul will top out at 27 degrees in the afternoon meanwhile the southern cities such as Gwangju and Busan will get up to uh, 20 uh, 7 and 23 degrees. Now moving over to other regions, Jeju Island tops out at 23, Tokto at 21, while Mangkumgang tops out at 18. Well, that's all I have at this moment. Back to you, Kanyang. 
All right, thank you, Michelle, for that, and thank you for watching. That's all from me at this hour. Our steady coverage on the nation's search and rescue efforts in Korea's ferry disaster continues here on Arirang. But in about an hour at 5.30 p.m. Korea time, we will be bringing you a live coverage of a Korea-U.S. summit news conference. Stay tuned to Arirang News.